Welcome to the Governance Podcast. My name is Mark Pennington and I'm the Director of the Centre for the Study of Governance and Society here at King's College London. I'm very pleased to have with me today Greg Collins, who's a lecturer in political science at Yale University. Greg is the author of Commerce and Manners in Edmund Burke, published by Cambridge University Press 2020, and he has wide-ranging interests in the political economy of Smith, Burke, and the history of political thought. He's going to be speaking to our centre in the next few hours on universality and complexity in the intellectual origins of liberalism and conservatism. So, Greg, it's very good to have you with us here on the Governance Podcast. Thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. So, I wonder if you could say a little bit about what you're going to speak about in this talk on complexity and the origins of liberalism and conservatism. What's the central theme that you're going to be exploring in that talk for the benefit of our listeners? Absolutely. So this theme emerged from actually the, my study of Burke and, and, and my Burke on Burke's political economy. His idea and his contemporary's idea of the relation between universal, transcendent, moral, theological, religious standards on the one hand, and a defense of complexity, distinctive customs, particularities, mm. depending on particular cultures, decorating the globe. And the talk, my talk tonight, will attempt to tease out how early modern proto-liberal and proto-conservative thinkers, including Burke, understood their relationship between universality and complexity, and whether they were able to reconcile, synthesize these two strands. And because in my studies of this topic, it's become almost like you know, a trope that it's framed as X thinker believes in these universal principles, but when applied to particular situations, he allows for customs. You know, across the political spectrum, I've heard this many, many times, mm -hmm. and this motivated me to actually dig a little deeper into these early modern thinkers to see whether how they understood this tension. And so the, talk, the focus of my talk tonight is this theme with a focus on the relation in particular between custom, a defense of custom and a defense of reason, really starting in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, and whether thinkers who defended custom were also able to advocate for a universal standard of morality, and whether those who are defending individual reason, uh, the social contract that occurs prominently, Hawk, uh, uh, Locke and Hobbes and so on, also were able to defend, uh, successfully, persuasively defend the city of custom. So can we come back to the custom reason distinction yeah. in a minute? I wonder if we could just say a little bit more at this stage about what you mean by the term complexity and how that's actually being used. Because I'm thinking with a sort of political economy hat on. When I hear complexity, I think of complexity theories these are complex phenomena or emergent systems yeah. in contrast to simple phenomena or simple systems. Yeah. So people normally think of the complex systems as being sort of non-linear in nature, yeah. that's sort of evolutionary open-ended, whereas simple systems are more sort of linear in, in character. Yeah. Is that the kind of distinction that's partly relevant to these kind of debates or are you, does complexity mean something else in this particular yeah, no, context? Yeah, that's, that's, that's only gesturing towards it. Um, at that basic level, I'm thinking of the recognition that human beings possess inherent differences. There are yeah. inherent disparities, inequalities in life. Some which are bad, but also some which could be good. Mm. And as I'm talking about differences in skills, experiences, yeah. knowledge, talents, yeah. backgrounds, wealth, pedigree, and so on. Yeah. And then also, more broadly speaking, custom and complexity in the sense of the proliferation of variety and diversity across the human globe. Different peoples practice different rituals, habits, patterns, mm. institutions over time. That, that for the proto-conservatives should caution us before we try to square them mm. into uniformity. Yep. On the other hand, the proto-liberals in asserting these universal conceptions of individual rights, human equality, applicable across, across nations and across cultures, for them they're att attempting to uh, establish this universal standard um, yep. through which we could judge the, the morality of uh, various rituals. So that's a sort of general sense when I, when I, yep. when I mention complexity. So the complexity question there is really whether or not a particular theory is able to take into account in some sense these differences. Yes. Or whether it thinks those differences should be overridden in, in, you know, in favor of other sorts of values. Yes. One, simply whether inequalities, disparities, complexities do exist. I mm. think it's fair, empirically it's, it's difficult to deny that. A. B. If they do exist, can we use our rational judgment to distinguish between those disparities which are yeah, morally defensible, tenable, cr yeah. credible on the one hand, and those disparities um, that are not. Yeah, and then the third um, uh, consideration is if they are not tenable, if they are unjust, mm. what it should 
other cultures try to reform mm. those unjust institutions, and if so, how so? And all those practical steps are woven into this broader theme of university and complex, universality and complexity mm. that I hope to teach No, that's, that sounds fascinating. Yeah. So maybe we can come back to those, those questions a little yeah. bit later on. I mean, that sounds, that sounds really, really interesting. So custom and reason, you know, what's the significance of the, the difference there or the, what questions are raised by that distinction? Yes. So this question is evident during the debate in England over the French Revolution, yep. between supporters of the revolution and critics of the revolution, critics of Clint Burke. But, and, and I teach this course uh, at Yale on the intellectual origins of liberalism and conservatism. Oftentimes these courses start the French Revolution, defenders of the revolution versus critics of, of the revolution. I start this course, however, in a little earlier time period that addresses precisely this theme, the tension between custom and reason, because Burke borrows from these debates and critics of Burke borrow from these debates also, the, mm -hmm. so the logic in, in their appraisals of the revolution. And so this tension, and, I, and I'm borrowing, I'm, I'm dead to, indebted to the work of uh, J.G. R. Pocock, the great intellectual historian, who I think provides the most persuasive or comprehensive account of this. But this tension emerged between a, a defense of custom by common lawyers, jurists who defend the common law tradition, classic mm -hmm. common law tradition in England on mm -hmm. one hand, versus those uh, such as Thomas Hobbes who are, who are asserting that reason is best understood not as collective wisdom embodied in customs emerging throughout time, but as a natural reason, use of our, uh, mm -hmm. man's natural capacities as mm -hmm. expressed by a sovereign through, a, a, let's say, a legislature, so an act of uh, parliament. Mm -hmm. and, and so for these common lawyers, they're defending this idea of custom in the sense that there are some practices and habits that are repeated throughout time by people that even if they're not carved into a statute written down to law, nevertheless obtain the force of law, the efficacy yeah. of law over time. And for in this conception, custom then reflected the collective wisdom of the multitudes mm -hmm. who try to uh, figure out the, be the best way to sort of orient their practices, habits, institutions that best reflect their particular needs and circumstances. This conception allows for <clears throat> the gradual preserva the, the preservation of customs that do work throughout time, as yeah. long as a custom preserves, promotes some sort of utility to the people practicing it. That the reasoning for these jurists is that why there's little reason to change these customs if they work, if they provide utility. Mm -hmm. um, but for these common uh, lawyers, it also allows for the gradual reform of customs yeah. and, uh, if possible, if necessary, elimination of customs if they outlive their utility or they're not simply yeah. Uh, fulfilling their purpose. Now, the strength of this approach is that it does allow for, to our earlier theme, complexity. Different peoples practice different customs. Classic example, first time in the States, I was telling Mark, first time in London, I was telling Mark, and I'm still getting used to the fact that cars, drivers <laughs> drive on the right side with the, 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 the wheels on the right side of the road and they drive on the left side of the road. And I, I continually to, to scare myself uh, whenever I'm in, a, in an Uber or taxi and they're driving on the left side of the road. And they're mainly going to take a turn and I'm thinking to myself, oh no, they're gonna, we're going to crash. But so different, you know, different driving rules, basic example of custom, which are not inherently just or unjust. It's yeah. not that... But people need to coordinate on one rule. Not people, not yes. As long, as long as there's an understanding that there's an element of coordination, collaboration yeah. that's taking place and that particular driving rules provide some sort of utility, benefit to the people, yeah. um, then, then that is a, a sort of a tenable form, form of custom. And, but if at some point, let's say, driving practices throughout time begin to generate more and more accidents, then the understanding is that the people will adapt to these circumstances and you know, adopt a different approach, yeah. which sometimes happens, sometimes not, but that's, that's understanding. So it depends, Comple the collective wisdom, gradual reform over time, and it cautions, I guess, into the most important philosophical point, it guards against the elevation of individual abstract reason mm -hmm. as the, the instrument to coordinate society. If so, yeah, go ahead, yeah. so I was going to say, so if, yeah. if we think of this in modern, modern terms, so this is a more like an evolutionary notion of rationality that, that's being described. Yeah, so in one sense, it, yes. Kind of practices that have survived in some sense that there's an assumption that if they've survived a long time, they've got some kind of utility, but it doesn't mean they're set in stone. Yeah. They can be subject to sort of incremental modifications. Yes, no, precisely. The, the, the idea of the presumptive wisdom, a presumptive wisdom in yeah. existing pre prevailing institutions, practices, habits. Yeah. Um, now, the phrase presumptive wisdom does not mean that it is inviolable yeah. um, wisdom that cannot be questioned. Yeah. But before changing one of these customs, one should, according to this line of thinking, should be aware of why the custom emerged yeah. in the first place. And there's a great quote by C.S. Lewis, Chesterton, 
before you tear down a fence, right? Make sure you understand why the fence was put up in yeah. the first place. So that's sort of understanding. Yeah. And, and then that understanding informs us of the limitations of individual reason. Because of the vast complexities of society, the, under, the, the, the thinking is that it is very difficult for the individual mind using yeah. so some powers of rational cognition to fully comprehend the complexities, the multi-layered sort of texture of human okay. affairs that otherwise is coordinated by, by these more practical habits and adaptations to emerging conditions. And how does that contrast with the more reason-focused view that you, you were describing as well? So for the reason, this is articulated both Hobbes and then Locke, it comes a little later. The existing habits, practices, traditions, such as in their day, let's say, a defense of the divine right of kings, a defense of property not as a natural right, but as an inheritance or a grant from a king and so on. Mm -hmm. If there is no rational justification for these habits and practices, or if the rational justification is only that it it, is, it reflects time memorial practices. For this line of thinking, that itself is not sufficient not to justify the to practices, it, yes. Yeah. And there, thereby, for Hobbes, law is natural reason embodied in sovereign through legislative acts. For Locke, he pushes this uh, line of reasoning further in his uh, more robust defense of natural rights uh, to life, liberty, and property. And for these natural rights, then, they're established as universal principles applicable in theory to all people all times regardless of circumstance and if there then is a custom habit practice that does not reflect these universal principles which in his case right to life liberty property human equality the right to individual bodily autonomy and so on then at the very least that sets a moral standard to judge the merit of customs and traditions and as i outline my talk there are actually benefits and drawbacks to both approaches. Yeah. The, ben the benefit of the, of the individual reason approach is that it does set a clear moral standard to judge practices. The drawback recalls our earlier comments that are these universal standards correct? And, if, and to what extent can they or should they be applied to other communities in which there may be particular customs and habits that work for those particular peoples, even if, let's say, yeah. they don't fully maximize like bodily autonomy or the natural right to property yeah. and so on. The strength of custom, as discussed, is that it does embody some collective wisdom of the multitudes. It cautions against the use of individual reason to coordinate the complexity of social affairs. It does allow for gradual reform, reform throughout time. The weakness, however, as I'll mention in my talk, is that it, it is vulnerable, vulnerable to the charge that it can lead to moral cultural relativism mm -hmm. and thereby permitting mm -hmm. any and all customs that, on, on the basis of that, it's simply distinctive of the particular tradition. I, I was going to say, yeah. the way you were describing that then, it, it struck me as being very similar to some kind of postmodernist concepts, actually, in the sense that yeah. there is no reason outside of the culture and practices that we, we reason with. Yeah. There yeah. isn't some reason with a capital R that is outside of that process. I mean, this is also an argument that people like Hayek make as well, yeah. who are yeah. not considered to be postmodernist, but it's a very postmodernist sounding argument that yeah. what someone thinks is reason is really just a product of the cultural circumstances that they're in. Yes, yes. And this is, and this is a sort of line of critique from, that can be leveled against the defenders of custom, but for these custom-oriented thinkers, and I'll discuss this with Burke and Richard Hooker, a prominent sort of 16th century theologian, this illustrates the importance of understanding how these thinkers um, understood, understood the connection between universality and complexity. One, one can certainly defend custom, complexity, particular rituals, and not embrace any transcendent moral standards. Mm -hmm. But these proto-conservative thinkers did try to reconcile this somehow. Mm -hmm. um, the basic understanding was that you can you can permit, if not necessarily fully support, but permit, tolerate, understand that different people simply have different ways of, of governing their lives, mm -hmm. and nevertheless conclude that there is an overarching transcendent standard, the law of God, the natural hierarchical organic unity of the universe mm -hmm. that ultimately governs all human beings. Yeah. And the understanding was that you could you could have both of these ideas and balance them in a way that could not deny some of these universal standards, but nevertheless permit an element of accommodation for particular circumstances. Now, with the proto-liberal thinkers, Hobbes, Locke, you touch on so little, and with regard to the, the English supporters of the French Revolution, they were also asserting these universal standards, but they're more abstract and rigid than, I, I would say, Burke and Hooker and some of these other defenders of custom. And, and then in my talk, I, I try to elaborate on whether they were also able to reconcile an embrace of universal standards with a sensitivity 
to custom and tradition. And well, I'm happy to talk about that here. Yeah, or, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Talk or, yeah. So where do, you, where do you see grounds for kind of compromise between these two positions? Yeah. Or is it one of these questions where, you know, you have to come down on one side of this fence rather, rather than another one? Yes, no, it's a good question. And I, as I caution my students, or as I, I try to juxtapose these comments in stark terms to my students, yeah. and then eventually I'm hoping to prompt one of them to raise their, you know, his or her hand and say, actually, Professor Collins, you know, re, you know, reason and custom actually blend, you know, can blend together in some ways. Yeah. And of course, uh, that's true. Custom reflects, can reflect collective reason. Uh, reason can, universal principles can reflect or accurately capture some common standards mm -hmm across cultures okay. and you know, go if ahead. I'm interjecting yeah. I mean, that's where I would think that there's a kind of case for <clears throat> some form of evolutionary reasoning coming in that although there may be differences across cultures there may be certain practices that seem to survive whatever the culture is so yeah. it yeah. seems yeah. pretty universally you know you have to have some kind of rules about not stealing or not killing or something of that kind and you could explain them in terms of having some kind of evolutionary property yeah. Whereas other kind of rules maybe are much more varied across places that you may not have quite the same confidence yeah. in them. Driving standards yeah. certainly vary across, not, not across countries, across states. Um, Connecticut, where I live, are uh, more undisciplined drivers than um, any other state I've, I've driven in. Sorry, apologies to the, uh, the people from Connecticut who are listening to this podcast. But even more basically, you know, the sociability of human beings, yeah. the fact that human beings necessarily across cultures... It is a observed empirical observation that can be elevated, I think, fairly into a sort of universal yeah. um, a lot of that. Human beings are born into families, brothers, sisters, husbands, yeah. wives. They're born into pre-existing social, religious structures. We, we need to seek purpose, meaning, belonging in some way beyond ourselves, whether it's through a spiritual resource or through our local social, religious, charitable, philanthropic, recreational institutions yeah. in some way. Yep. And and so yes, so, so they, there's a, there can be a minimal the understanding was there can be a minimal recognition of these commonalities, a common human ground amongst human beings from across cultures, which did not preclude the possibility that in other ways there could be you know manifest meaningful differences. Yep. Yeah. So if we take the the more rationalistic side, what would be examples you think from that side of the argument where you know, there are certain traditions and practices that we could reform on the basis of this kind of reason with a capital R. Yeah. What, what would be examples of, of that? Yeah, you know, so the classic example, of course, is you know, slavery, transatlantic yeah. trans slave trade. Yeah. And uh, if you are you know, a, a, a critic of slavery, let's in the 18th century, and I did some work on this with Burke, who's hmm. um, one of the, most people don't know this, but he's actually the, the perhaps the first prominent English statesman to draft a comprehensive detailed plan for the gradual abolition of the slave trade yeah. and the gradual abolition of slavery. Yeah. Generally, he was in support of gradual abolition as opposed to immediate, immediate abolition, which I'm also I'm happy to talk about them yeah. during my talk. Right. But if you are a critic of slavery, but nevertheless, you are distrustful of this idea of abstract reason, individual mm -hmm. reason, mm -hmm. could you really put, is there a way to persuasively argue for abolition of slavery based on a defense of custom. Being that one of the drawbacks of custom, of course, is that people can practice unjust habits over yeah. time as well as just moral yeah. habits over time. And at some point, you know, an initial act of conquest or usurpation over time can settle into a custom, even if yeah. it's bad. So it would be difficult just to rely on an argument of custom to fight against slavery, unless, I was thinking about this, you could argue that the violent seizure of individuals, let's say in Africa, in pre-existing social networks itself, mm -hmm. that itself was a disruption of custom mm -hmm. of, of those Africans. So, you know, that, there's that argument as well. But yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Could you also do it as a form of kind of imminent criticism where, you know, if you if sort of internally within your other practices, you don't think it's acceptable to own other people or yeah. to behave in certain ways towards them. Yeah. But somehow there is this exception for a certain class of people that are treated differently, wouldn't you sort of see that as an in, potentially as an internal sort of tension within your system that might prompt you to to revise it or to think about it in a critical spirit? Yeah, in the sense that if your own community does embrace 
standards of, let's say, liberty yeah. as, as an example of individual reason or an example of custom? Because uh, I guess as you could, an example well, of custom. Okay, yeah, custom, yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. You're, you're, yeah. So th this custom of individual liberty, yeah. let's say, is you know, may, may or may not be universal, but at the very least, this is custom, yeah. custom that you practice. And based on your good faith, moral judgments of... Why aren't you practicing yeah, it consistently? Yeah, yeah. And so that's absolutely a way you could utilize custom for that. Actually, another, another persuasion we had to, 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 to employ custom for that, for that practice. So that's a classic example. Other ways, individual reason, you know, even attempts to simply you know, reduce the arbitrary power of, you know, name your governmental institution or religious institution yeah. based on the fact that it does, you can use in your individual reason to connect the dots between this act of arbitrary power and a violation of common human decency, you know, mm -hmm. common understanding that you should not, you should treat people with dignity. Yeah. In that sense, you could blend, if, you're, if your community adopts this belief as a custom, but the custom also reflects universal principle. Then that could be another case in which you know you can blur the line between custom and reason to to use to to reform if, or eradicate an institution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you use? Is there a way of trying to use the kind of the more evolutionary mindset in quite a universalistic way? If that's not a contradiction. So what I'm thinking of yeah. there is you know if you have a kind of general view that um, the world is complex, that nobody's omniscient, then you could sort of think of saying that you are using individual reason in that sense, but you're understanding reason as a way of understanding actually the limits of that very kind of thinking. So yeah. what I'm thinking of there is, I mean, yeah. I think... I think I don't think it actually comes from Hayek himself, but he he often makes reference to. I think he attributes it to Hume talking about using reason to under, understand the limits of reason. Yes, yeah. That kind of idea. So you get a quasi-universalistic standard, but from this different form of thinking. Yes, so it's yes. It's not abstract rationalism, but it still arrives at kind of universalistic type conclusions, which means you would be skeptical of people who claim great deals of great amount of power, power or who claim to be able to sort of reorganize a whole society. Yes. A kind of universal skepticism almost. Yes, yes. And I, and I should preface this the conversation by saying individual reason itself, it, recognizing the limits of individual reason, as you, as you mentioned, is itself an act of individual reason. Yeah. And recognizing the limits of individual reason doesn't negate the fact that as human beings, is going back to Aristotle, yeah. all of us, we're we rational to, creatures. Yeah, we as you think of rational. Of, of course, we have to use judgment, you yeah. know. Now, in his sense, he's not necessarily referring to sort of, um, um, I would say, not the type of enlightenment rationalism that, that emerged later, but simply this idea of we, we, can make, we can make judgments between good, bad, you know, just, unjust. Yeah. And uh, he had this notion of practical wisdom, you know, that, that yeah. sort of, you know, we, experience, we use good faith judgments based on our experience uh, about, uh, about some practical practice in pursuit of you know, some teleological you know, final end. And so the individual, so uh, the uh, criticism of individual reason itself, I think, actually affirms the importance, the value of individual reason, as long as we are aware of its limits in understanding, yeah. again, the complexities of society. And, and especially when um, people with power exercise individual reason without recognizing the limits of an individual reason, I think, um, you know, certainly particularly dangerous. As well as, you know, a defense of custom, if it does turn into blind deference, and this is maybe the, the main criticism of the defense of custom, a blind deference to the status quo, you know, with you know, no resist, no, full resistance to any sort of gradual form of incre incremental change. That itself is also equally, I yeah. think, is dangerous. Um, well, that, I was going to say that because there you can think of examples in, say, religious practice where someone kind of claims in a quasi-totalitarian way to know the whole religious yeah. tradition, yeah. when actually there are different kind of sub-traditions within it. There's no such thing as the tradition. Whenever you look at what people call a culture, there are normally multiple cultures within it yeah so there isn't a kind of sovereign position where you can see this is what the tradition implies necessarily and this way to my comments to have richard hooker who not many people know about him, but he's sort of a more more prominent most prominent articulate precursor to burke yeah. when he was trying to defend the elizabethan establishment remember english history listen probably knows better than i if you're from england but trying to defend the idea of a Christian Commonwealth church-state integration from, in his time, the threat of uh, Puritanism, sort of narrow scripturalism that was advocating one single interpretation um, of the Bible. And so for Hooker, 
he's defending the state establishment of a church. And this actually relates to your other question about ways we can um, apply these, uh, 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 these principles today. He was a defending state establishment, much like Burke did. But uh, to your point, he did understand that there were good faith differences in interpretation mm-hmm. of scripture, mm-hmm. you know, and therefore there should not be one single narrow standard that should be imposed. Given that he did defend the traditional rituals, customs of uh, the Church of England, but nevertheless, he was pushing back against this notion that there can be single infallible standards of, 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 of you know, biblical exegesis. And then this also relates to this idea that you can nevertheless have a church state establishment and the understanding was, this was a conventional understanding, but Burke and Hooker really um, voiced um, a sharp expression about this, but still nevertheless tolerate religious differences, even if those differences did not, even if dissenting uh, denominations did not possess the same amount of privileges as the established church, nevertheless, yes, you could certainly practice your religion. And now this was their way of trying, another way of uh, trying to reconcile universality and complexity in society. Now, this may not be convincing, especially for the critics of Burke, who were saying, no, 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 established church, you know, if, if you need public professions of faith for public office and so on, public financing of, you know, one religion over the others, this itself was you know, unjust and unequal. And there's only something to that. But this was the way that, you know, Burke and Hooker and these proto-conservatives trying to show some sensitivity to good faith religious differences while nevertheless preserving this underlying religious social structure of, of society. I wonder that may be a good point to, to move on to, to talk about some of the work you've done on, on the book. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if you could say a bit about how you do position him as a, as a thinker. So you've described him there as a kind of proto-conservative. Yeah. There are all these debates about, <laughs> was he a conservative? Was he a kind of liberal conservative? Was he a conservative liberal? Yeah. I'm thinking about some of the debates around free trade, which are, yeah. which are sort of coming up again today, where yeah. I, he, I, he's always struck me as a as a kind of supporter of, of free trade, yeah. very skeptical of, of sort of protectionist arguments. But yeah. you have people today who often invoke kind of Burkean logic yeah. to be skeptical of free trade on the grounds that it's too destabilizing yeah. of pre-existing traditions or practices. Yeah. So where, how do you sort of position Burke in this, in this sense? Yes, yes. Now, this is a, <laughs> this is a running debate. I, I, th- I think it's fair to say, I know, it's a cliche, but I think it's, cliches sometimes are true, right? I, I think it's certainly fair to say he... He outlined in modern Anglo-American history the arguments that are most commonly associated with conser- intellectual conservatism today. Yeah. But given that, you know, when we say conservatism, it does, to your question, incorporate, I think, a, 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 good, a, a liberal element, liberal defined in a variety of ways, one in terms of economics at that time period. And not just Berkshire, you know, some of the, you know, Hume, some, some of these other thinkers um, adopted this, you know, this, this logic as well. You could have... An, economic sort of freedom of commerce, market liberty in some way, which should be encouraged for many of the reasons we're familiar with today, increases public prosperity, raises standards of living, helps the poor, uh, and so on, as long as, to my earlier comments, these underlying social, religious, moral structures were preserved throughout yeah, society. Yeah, yeah. So this is why yeah. he is trying to thread a needle, some things per se, some people don't, but thread a needle, you preserve Church of England, monarchy, nobility, and so on, while accommodating religious dissenters, while accommodating free trade arguments, liberty of commerce, and specifically with regards to free trade. In my book on his political economy, this became sort of a pet project of mine to actually figure out whether he was a, can we, can we accurately characterize him as a free trade supporter? I think we can, but at that time, there was a British empire, and the argument was, his argument was that, yes, free trade should be promoted within the British empire as captured by the Navigation Acts, the classic Navigation mm-hmm. Acts, British trade tree moved British ships, British, ship, British sailors, and so on. And for him, so the benefit of free trade is precisely that. It, it uh, was an example of mutual benefits from consenting nations, increased public prosperity. It was not a, a zero-sum contest, and so on. And for him, this is why he was famously an advocate of the Irish free trade bills yeah. of the 1770s. Yeah. And of course, he was born in Ireland. But but the the, the the qualification of this argument, and Adam Smith also, I wrote a piece on Adam Smith's ideas on the Navigation Acts as well, is that outside the British Empire, the most prominent rival of Britain was France at that time, the understanding was that free trade you know, outside of your empire could be subject to attack by your foreign rivals. And therefore, free trade was not simply an economic argument, but also political national, yeah. national security implications. Yeah. So he was uh, more cautious about extending free trade uh, relations yeah. to rivals such as France. You relate that to today, you know, rough comparison, classic China. And and so, you know, it's, it's, it's similar, you know, it's, it's remarkable how some of these arguments do 
rhyme over time, yeah. you know, even if it's not yeah. a, a, a complete yeah. analog. But across you know, China today, if we have, if a nation has deep economic relations with an adversary that holds antithetical values to you, to what extent should you preserve those economic ties? To what extent should you eliminate them? And it's a very tricky question. Hmm. And the, you know, the, the, the deep relevance is that, you know, from Burke's perspective, and Smith also, you know, Hume, you know, there was a, such thing as a nation, as an empire, some underlying, back to this idea of universal and complexity, some underlying shared cultural, moral, religious standards. And promoting economic relations with an entity out, that did not necessarily share all those uh, values, that raised these pl- broader moral political questions about the extent of commercial activity and disrupting those existing traditions. And this is why, you know, for Burke, this is why he, one reason why he was so insistent on preserving religion church, Christianity, and so on. Because for him, the disruptive effects, the unpredictable effects of commercial activity at that time, for him, could be cushioned, sustained by these broader religious moral supports. In particular, he means yeah, the Church of England, also the, the nobility. Mm-hmm. So, such as uh, the when he was defending the right of primogeniture, the right of first yeah. ones to inherit the estate, which for him preserved, you know, strengthened, you know, pedigreed families over time, preserved this, li- this idea of continuity, also from generation to generation. So that not all commercial activity, you know, not all land would be subject to the, you know, the whims of the market. Um, and uh, for him, this was his way to preserve, preserve this, these universal underlying standards that could nevertheless tolerate, you know, fluxes and complexities. So yeah. do, I, do I detect a, a bit of a distinction there between, between, say, Adam Smith and Burke? So, I mean, Smith makes some arguments where you could have very specific cases where you might want to break from free trade on yeah. what today people might call national security type grounds. Yeah. But the point is they are very specific. Yeah. They're quite limited. And there's also a very clear sense that these very kind of arguments or situations could be exploited by yeah. people for protectionist reasons. Yeah. So we ought to be also skeptical of yes. them. Yeah. What I'm getting from your description of Burke there is more of a general wariness that if you're trading with people who have different value systems that this can have impacts for you know your own society in some kind of destabilize potentially destabilizing but is that is that accurate that i think generally broader... yeah generally that is accurate which also explains why smith himself he was, he was more eager yeah. to extend uh, yeah. commercial relations to yeah. france right yes. in the wealth of nations yeah, yeah. so this is one area of tension between burke and smith and there's a famous quote that you know they, they met each other and then you know after they met they realized you know they they, they hold had written, they have very similar, held very similar issues on matters relating to political economy, more so than any other person. So there's certainly a deep, deep affinity with their views. But and yes, this is one area of tension I do think that is certainly fair to, to note. But, you know, Bur- Burke was also more religious than Smith. Um, and, and also, Burke himself was aware of these protectionist arguments. One of, the first, one of his first major acts in Parliament was trying to promote uh, the Freeport Act of 1766. For those who are interested in the labyrinthine debates of 18th century commercial policy, but this, he was, he, he, when he was when he entered Parliament, he was trying to promote free trade relations between the British uh, West Indies and the Americas, so lowering you know, duties and, uh, and, and so on in, in the sugar industry. And so he was he was a leading advocate for lowering these trade prohibitions and restrictions. Mm-hmm. So he was certainly aware that the he was trying to fight protect, these protection sympathies, who trying to yeah. erect barriers to protect their industries. And so he was certainly aware of these arguments. And he it's also interesting I noticed in this book. He characterized these protection sympathies as the word pre- the prejudice, prejudice sympathy, pre- prejudicial sympathies, which is common to what we think about today, prejudice in favor of you know our, our one particular nation over the other and so on. Mm-hmm. But it's particularly interesting with regard to Burke, because Burke is also famous for defending a conception of prejudice, mm-hmm. what he phrased, what he framed as just quote just prejudice in the reflection on the revolution in France. And here he's referring not to simply he's not referring to, to invidious arbitrary prejudice, yeah. but prejudice in, in the sense of at the collection of customs, inherited institutions yeah. throughout time that reflected, distilled uh, wisdom of, of the people. Mm-hmm. If someone attacks your family, you can be prejudicial in favor of your family, your children, yeah. you know, your, your, yeah. your, your, your community, and, and so on, yeah. your, your university. And this is, what he, this is what he meant by just prejudice. And so he carved out implicitly, he didn't you know, write a systematic treatise on this, but he, there is a distinction he conveyed between the study of just prejudice and, let's say, you know, we can call it unjust prejudice. So protecting one's own interests for the sake of protecting one's own, own interests with no, with little concern for us, so the broader public welfare. Broader yeah. welfare. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you think his, how, what do you think would be his, I mean, I, these questions are always unfair, but what, what do you think his stance would be today if you're thinking <laughs> about these kind of debates about free trade and 
you know, the, the, the <coughs> tension that there is between sort of free trading liberals or liberal conservatives, and then you have these various national conservative movements which yeah. are making these kind of very anti-trade yeah. arguments in, in many, well, it's certainly happening in the United States, but it's increasingly happening here in yeah. Europe as, as, as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and uh, so I've thought about this. Um, I don't think he would have either a supported the immediate abolition of all trade barriers. Yeah. I also don't think he would have supported the immediate establishment of all trade barriers yeah. between um, so yeah. Britain, England, and, and, yeah. and, and foreign adversaries. I think, generally speaking, consistent with his idea that there was a um, notion of a Commonwealth of Europe defending European Christian civilization at that time, mm -hmm. and, and, and specifically that the British Empire and, and, uh, reflecting these shared bonds, social, religious, moral, and so on. Generally speaking, today, he, I, I could possibly see him you know, advocating for the gradual elimination of trade barriers between, let's say, the U.S. or Britain and other nations that mm -hmm. shared yeah. similar value systems, yeah, yeah, yeah. either religiously, morally, and so on. Some sort of constitutional government. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys know, still have a king, as far as I know, but our we queen, do, yeah. yeah. And we, we, you know, as Americans, we don't like that, but otherwise, otherwise, they're enough certainly shared affinities. So I, I think that would be his framework. Gradually steer trade towards hospitable countries that hold some overla overlapping political, moral, religious interests, and then mm -hmm. gradually steer trade away from you know, foreign adversaries. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, that I think that's some approach you would take, very you know, more difficult to, to impl implement in practice, given the deeply entrenched economic interest yeah. in China. And, and of course, this is I mean, the classic argument. So that, he wouldn't you know, be a kind of deuce commerce theorist sort of saying that the more you yeah. trade with these countries, the more likely they are to sort of embrace some of your values or this kind of thing. You'd be yeah. quite skeptical of that. No, that. That's a great question. And I thought about this, you know, as well while writing the book. I, I, my, my conclusion was that, so he certainly understood the du commerce arguments, pardon my French, um, you, know, the, uh, you know, trade tends to promote peaceful relations yeah. among the um, nations. I think, ultimately, I think for him, tr a precondition of that reasoning was those shared commitments beforehand, yeah. Yeah. generally speaking. Given that, he certainly understood that free trade could soothe calm political tensions, such as the case of England and Ireland at the time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Ireland was quasi you know, in, in the British Empire already. And, and so for him, I think there are these pre preconditions for him that would allow the Duke Commerce thing to really so unveil it itself. Be, as, it wouldn't be deployed as a kind of abstract principle, because that would be... Closer to the, uh, yeah, going back to the earlier conversation, yeah. because to the individual reason, kind of more rationalistic view of. I think it's very fair. That's very fair. And in fact, later, so he, um, he did oppose efforts in the 1780s to promote free trade between mm -hmm. England and France. Mm -hmm. Precisely on the idea that France was an, uh, an yeah. antagonist of England and they don't yeah. you know, shared uh, different uh, uh, you know, religions and, and uh, different national, national security yeah. interests. Um, so, you know. Okay, so the. Final part of the conversation, I wonder if we could move to, I mean, you, staying with Burke momentarily, if you could say a little bit about his, how this approach applied to his attitude towards slavery and how, you know, slavery should be sort of gradually abolished. But I wonder if we could might use that as an opportunity to connect onto some of the future work I understand that you're doing. So I understand that you've got interest in, in looking at Afri African-American political thought. So I wonder if you could say a bit about those two things about Burke on slavery and then maybe just segue into talking about this new this new project on African American political thought. Oh sure. Uh, so Burke was so even even though he defended this idea of custom to this question of the relation between universality and complexity, he did you know he was a firm theist, perhaps and Christian defender defender of the Anglican Church, and he did have this underlying conception of what he called a moral law, sort of natural law, moral natural law, something like that. I think maybe he thought natural was a little too abstract, but a moral law binding all human beings together. And this really comes out in his speeches on the impe impeachment proceedings of, of Warren Hastings. And, and so he certainly understood this underlying moral standard that should be some sort of guide for understanding social relations, which I think ultimately informed his views on slavery. So his views on slavery, well, that well, he, he opposed slavery for most of his adult political career, he was an advocate of gradual abolition as opposed to immediate abolition. First, in, around 1780, he drafted this, I mentioned before, this comprehensive, detailed, if flawed plan for gradual abolition of the slave trade and gradual abolition of slavery, which would have really conflicted with his competing approach of imperial humility. It would have required a vast expansion of 
imperial authority on the coast of Africa yeah. and, and West Indies and so on. But that this was sort of his, 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 his way to try to impose costs on the slave trade, so that eventually it would wither out. He briefly came around to the to the position of immediate abolition during the slave um, trade debates in the late 1780s, yeah. but then he, he reverted back to gradual abolition right. after, in his judgment, the calls for immediate abolition were too abstract. That for him would fuel political radicalism, and for him that was you know too too, too uncom- destabilizing. Yeah, too too destabilizing. Yeah. And so for him, consistent with his his broader broader political project about conservation and reform, mm-hmm. you want to conserve the best of a tradition. You want to reform the worst. In this case, you want to conserve you know, reform the worst, which slavery, while nevertheless not you know, mm-hmm. tearing down society in the British West Indies in particular. So his plan was for a gradual abolition in, in which slaves would receive incrementally more and more property rights, rights to maintain you know, family structure, rights to practice either the Christian religion or he did allow some room for you know, non-Christian indigenous religions as well, which underscores this point that his preference was for Christianity, but you know, he tolerated you know, the, the various religious practices. So you gradually build your way up, build, build up the property structures, family religious life of slaves and, and to a point in which they could you know, purchase their freedom or, or the, slave would, the slave owner would, uh, could release him. And so that was his general position on slavery. The, the Brits abolished slave trade in 1807, I believe. They, they, they beat the Americans by a year. And then eventually they abolished slavery throughout the, most, most of slavery throughout the empire in the 1830s with a gradual apprenticeship, apprenticeship program at, at first before people got, the slaves got disgusted by it. But the, the intriguing thing is that this gradualist approach of Burke, which is not distinctive of him, at that, at that time, of course, if you're advocating for immediate abolition, especially yeah. before the late 1780s, then you're considered a radical. Who, very, very who, radical. Right, yeah, who, no one's going to take you seriously. Yeah. So this is not particularly distinctive of Burke. Uh, what, what Burke's contribution, I think, was, was some sort of the most pl- uh, comprehensive um, plan um, by a British statesman, who was also, if you recall, uh, representing Bristol, and uh, who uh, prepares the slave trade. And uh, so certainly this is a politically delicate uh, topic, as it said at least. But for him, this gradualist approach was you know, embraced by later anti-slavery um, activists, including Wilberforce, although so Wilberforce was not fully comfortable with the gradualist approach, but never, he, he recognized that slavery should you know, emerge in phased you know, uh, increments. And so that approach, Burke you know, was, did, did try to support you know, throughout, his, throughout his career. And then transitioning to my current project, on African-American political thought, the connection between Burke and his liberalism, conservatism, and this topic does not seem to be. But I did realize after teaching a course on, multiple, t- multiple times of this course on African-American political thought in Yale's Ethics, Politics, and Economics program, one common theme amongst many of these thinkers we read, from Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Du Bois, yeah. Booker T. Washington, to some of these lesser known female thinkers, Anna Julie Hayward Cooper, Fanny Barry Williams, through to contemporary black liberal and conservative writers, was the importance of some form of social organization, civil society institutions. Mm-hmm. And this kept reminding me, because I just completed this Burke project, of Burke's famous phrase, little platoon. Little platoon, little platoon which he meant specifically sort of the social orders and classes and ranks in society, including those that are represented in the legislature, but broadly meaning our social, moral, religious networks. Back to our earlier point about how because we're natural social animals, we do, we need support from others around us, our families, our neighborhoods, and so on, to give us meaning and purpose as, 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 a, as what, he, what he calls a germ of our public affections. We can't embrace this abstract idea of the state until we you know, have these, these more meaningful social, relations on the lo- social relationships on a local level. And so in these African-American thinkers, they're embracing, I think, certainly a, a very similar conception of the importance of civil society institutions, particularly because at that time period in American history, there was rampant segregation that prohibited mm-hmm blacks, many blacks from participating in white run civil society institutions, mm-hmm. either by law or simply by, by, by custom, yeah. to, to the point about yeah. that, you know, some, how some customs, customs can be unjust. Um, so and they so, had to have it, a parallel structure? So, 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 civil society, so for them, this was not a matter of you know, finding meaning and purpose, but also a matter of survival yeah. in terms of providing religious support, material welfare, mm-hmm. social and, and so on, uh, philanthropic. And particularly after slavery, when during American Reconstruction, it was uh, to be a, you know, many, many, many challenges and, and failures. And so, given this, given the lack of in this under system of slavery, which discouraged the build-up formation of self-governing civil society institutions, this was an integral, integral element of trying to transition from slavery to freedom. In which, again, you know, the slavery system discouraged you know the, the strengthening of families and the strengthening of independent black religious institutions. So I noticed that these thinkers identified this theme regardless of the time period in which they were writing. Douglas himself, I'm finishing my chapter on Douglas, his idea of civil society. W.B. Du Bois, he provides probably the most systematic empirical account of black civil society institutions from 19th century through the early 20th century. Uh, and I'll weave in uh, additional thinkers as well. And so 
connecting that to so these broader themes, there were a variety, a diversity, a complexity of different civil society institutions within black communities across the United States, also white communities, for religious purposes, promoting moral instruction, um, philanthropic charitable initiatives, insurance societies, burial societies, and so on, economic cooperatives, uh, black community members pulling their resources for some concrete purpose in, in local communities. And you know, some of these ventures were failures, uh, as all you know, voluntary social organizations are, including some in, in, involuntary social organizations. But you know, so many, were, many were successful. Many were earnest attempts to try to build up self-governing civil society institutions at this time. That reflected this idea of the idea of a, the importance of a little, little platoon of society. And uh, so that's a connection between Burke and those thinkers. And you know, and who would be the sort of contemporary African American thinkers who you would position as being within that? That tradition, you know, so that, that people might be interested in in reading to sort of follow up on these themes. Who are the people yeah. who sort of are in that that spirit in terms of looking for how you might build on those kind of structures? Yeah. So the the the, the interesting thing about sort of civil society communitarian, I should just mention, so the, the the theoretical premise is uh, Tocqueville's um, Democracy in America. Yeah. Um, he, in which he describes prominently this distinctive characteristic of Americans we like to associate with them for some common undertaking, the art of association. So I apply that idea to the, these thinkers and how they deepened, built on, departed from this Tocqueville's idea of voluntary associations. In terms of contemporary black thinkers, civil society, you know, the idea of civil society can actually span the ideological spectrum, which is one reason why I find the concept so fascinating. You have liberal communitarians advocating civil society, you have conservative communitarians, libertarian communitarians, and so on. So in terms of contemporary black, think contemporary black thinkers, He's not, the first one that comes to mind, he isn't even an um, intellectual, but Robert Woodson, who's known in the United States as a, sort of a, a, a prominent advocate of civil society institutions. Yeah. In terms of intellectual, Thomas Sowell you know, comes, comes to mind, considered to be a sort of a free market, conservative libertarian economist, but, but he's also certainly aware of the importance of these voluntary associations in the black community structures throughout time, including his interesting description of Dunbar High School, which was the most prestigious black exclusive public high school at the turn of the 20th century, which was outperforming white high schools in D.C. at that time. And here's a case, it was publicly funded, but here's a case of black parents, black students voluntarily congregating, uh, coordinating themselves together to promote you know, high standards of academic excellence, despite the patterns of racial segregation. But even you know, in terms of, you know, there are radical, progressive black thinkers, even like Cornell West, I assign, yeah. who is aware of the importance of civil society. He, he he's criticizing this co the commodification of social relations, which is actually you know, Burke has some of that in his thought as well. But even radical black thinkers are aware of the importance of communitarian organizations in civil society for reasons not unlike these African American thinkers I you know, I teach in my class. Um, and is this something you're going to be working on in the future? Is is, is there a book project you say that's coming out of this? Or yeah, so 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 the the, the hope is a book project of the introduction chapters of Frederick Douglass and Du Bois almost complete. Um, my next step is uh, Booker T. Washington, who's considered, mm -hmm. poses as a contrast to Du Bois. Du Bois emphasized classical education, Washington from industrial education. But again, but to the point about civil society, so unites these various thinkers together, even if, they had, even if they had diverse strands of thought, both Washington and Du Bois understood the importance of so, black social, organ, voluntary social organizations to, you know, for racial uplift and racial progress. So the, yeah, the hope is, yeah, the book manuscript on this, on this idea, because I, 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 as far as I know, I've, I've done research on the, on the literature, I have, I have not come across a book on the hist history of the, a pol the political theory of this idea in black civil society. There's a lot of books on the empirical historical dimensions of this, much, a lot of good work done by uh, historians and some economists. But in terms of my, my field of political theory, political philosophy, there is not a book, as far as I know, on tracing sort of, intell sort of intellectual origins of this idea of black civil society in early black political thought from the late 18th century through to the early 20th century. Well, that sounds like a terrific project and I really look forward to, to it coming out in print and maybe talking about it at some point yes. in the, the future. Yes. But, well, you've got to actually give a talk for us today. Yes, yeah. So at this point, I think it just remains for me, for me to say thank you very much, Greg Collins, and I uh, hope you've enjoyed the, the, the experience of being on the Governance Podcast. So thank you very much. No, you're welcome. This is fantastic. Thank you for the questions. Thank you.